Okay, so uh, I think I got like half an hour and then some questions. Welcome everybody to this talk. I want to be quite fast. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Angel, Angel Medina. People ask me, where do you live? And I'm like, where I park my car in Spain. Okay, living is such another thing. Because I always like, like on airports, trains, traveling all around the world, which is nice. But sometimes a little bit exhausting. I've already been one week here in Poland. I've been in Krakow for the whole week, and then I'm Poznan for the weekend. I'm going to Breno for the next week. I have to say that I love coming to, to Poland. It's so fun. I always have a, a very nice time. So thank you for inviting me. You have a couple of informa um, interesting information here. One is this website, projectalis.com slash en for English slash Angel Medinilla, because if you go to that website, there's links to a lot of stuff, including these slides, okay? So if you want to download them later, and also you have uh, the slides of our Scrum course, the Kanban course, the Coaching Agile Team course, the Agile Contracts, uh, Agile Management, uh, I don't know, you name it, Lean Startup for Agile Product Management. There's a lot of stuff in that website. And then there's also the Twitter handle, okay? Um, Angel underscore M. There's a reason that the Twitter handle is there, and it's because my, my hungry ego needs to be fed, okay? So if you follow me, you are feeding my ego. Thank you so much for that. And if you upload pictures of, of me doing talks, because if I stop the talk to take selfies, that's like not very polite. But if you upload pictures of me, just please remember this is my good side. Okay, don't, don't take pictures of me when I'm like, like, like you know, showing on my belly. <laughs> I've been on a diet, please don't do that for me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I also published a, a couple of books. Uh, one is Agile Management. It's about uh, managing companies uh, that are agile. It uh, talks about what happens when agile evolves out of the container of the team. Okay, some people do believe that Scrum Agile is something that you do at the team level. Okay, it's like the team is a black box. Uh, they do Scrum or something in the inside. We put coffee and user stories, and then we get some software, hopefully. And it's not like that, okay? So I wrote a book about that. And then I have a second book about Kaizen, continuous improvement in agile organizations, agile Kaizen. So I'm gonna give this two to Agatha, who is my host, as far as I know. Thank you, Agatha. And you can keep them, so I hope you have a company library. If not, you can start it now. <laughs> um, what else? Well, I'm, um, I, I like to introduce myself as a trench consultant in the sense that the, we were talking about that yesterday in the dinner. There are some professional speakers, and that's nice. We need those. But they seem to get out of touch with reality, okay? So I know a lot about companies like yours because I've been working with so many kinds of companies all around the world, and I keep doing that. I train companies, I coach companies, I help them in agile transformations, but then I enjoy so much doing public speaking, because you know, in another life I would have been like a stand-up comedian or something, so my escape to be a little bit of stand-up comedian is doing public speaking, so I hope you enjoy. Um, what else? I'm part of the Management 3.0 movement. I'm a licensed trainer. If you know this guy, Jurgen Apelo, he's uh, from the Netherlands. He wrote a nifty book about management and management in the 21st century. And oh, look, a kitten! A beautiful kitten! <laughs> Why do I put kittens in a presentation? Because it's a given fact, scientific fact, that if you put kittens in a presentation, you get 25% better feedback after it, okay? So please remember the kitten. The kitten was cute. <laughs> Even though I hate cats, I mean, I think cats are burning and they should be exterminated from the surface of the earth. <laughs> but people do love kittens. So they should... <laughs> people love kittens. Oh, kittens, remember the kitten later when you give feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm so sorry. This is not a technical talk, okay? Um, I, I stopped coding 10 years ago. That was a huge mistake. Oh, God, how I miss coding when I could do like some kung fu. I cannot do any kung fu anymore. But I still can understand uh, jokes like this one, no? Where this guy tried to do an SQL injection attack on the traffic radars or something like that, okay? I think it's a Polish car, okay? By the way, it's happened here. Okay? <laughs> Anyway, uh, my pleasure. Those were my vanity slides, okay? That's my presentation. Um, so how much time did you save? I had like 50 slides to go, and I'll have like 25 minutes probably. Uh, and thank you, oh, by the way, Agatha, thank you for the worst slot in the conference on a Saturday afternoon after two talks. <laughs> what? <laughs> in our way to the party? <laughs> so that's tough, okay? So this is like, wow, challenging my skills on keeping people awake and interested. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Okay, so this talk is about self-organizing teams. Somewhere in history, you might be 
have been uh, exposed to this idea of hyper-productive, self-organizing, agile teams. Isn't the name awesome? I mean, it's better than the Avengers. Avengers is nice, but hyper-productive, self-organizing, agile teams. <laughs> that basically beats Avengers, okay? It's like, oh, yeah, I want that. <laughs> Uh, maybe a engine thing is nice, but being hyper-productive and self-organizing and agile, wow, that's awesome. I want to be like that. So, and we were inspired by a lot of stories about uh, things, uh, stories, I mean, by things like Google. Oh, Google gives 20% of the time to the people to work on whatever they want. It seems to be not the, the, the story anymore, but we were so inspired by it. And then we read about companies like, like Spotify, where each team decides what features do they, do they develop into the product, and they are like very self-organizing, and they have a lot of freedom. And they, we, we listen stories about, about Va, um, Semco, a Brazilian company where people um, fix their own salaries. They design their own salaries, and where teams are hiring their managers. They will interview someone and say, why do you want to be our manager? What are you going to do for us as a manager? How cool is that? And then you listen, you still, you listen to stories and you hear stories about Valve, this uh, software company doing video games. You remember Counter-Strike, Half-Life. And in Valve, you have no managers. And we're like, oh, wow, no managers. <laughs> what does it tell about our managers that we are so appealed by a company with no managers? Okay, ouch. That hurts, okay? And then we, today we learn about Springest, when they do holacracy. And you're like, wow, like we have a constitution. How cool is that? So we are really inspired by this kind of stories. They seem to touch our spine somehow. They talk to our values, our identity, our autonomy, our motivation. So we, we basically buy the stuff and we say on, an, and on a Monday morning, 8 a.m., we say, hey, you know what? We are going agile. We are going hyper-productive. We are going self-organizing. Release the Kraken. And then uh, something funny happens. <laughs> That's the reason of the t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> Release the Kraken. Well, here I am at the Kraken. And you're like, no, this is not what I was expecting. Okay, If you've seen Futurama, Dr. Soidberg is not what you're depicturing when you think about hyper-productive self-organizing teams. I mean, you go on a Monday morning and you say, hey, we're implementing Scrum. Implementing, I love that word. Implementing Scrum. And we are self-organizing, release the craking, and bad things happen. And the reason of that, I think it's how Esther Derby puts it, self-organizing team may be the most overused, misunderstood, vague, and misleading phrase of the decade. <laughs> okay. This might be like a little bit uh, <laughs> pessimist, but, but I resonate with this kind of definition. I think we don't understand what's the meaning of self-organization, and we try to mimic what other people like Google, Valve, uh, Springest, uh, Semco, Netflix, or the Zappos are doing, and we got it wrong. Like, for instance, we understand that agile is anarchy, it's no managers. Self-organization means that the team is self-organization. If you put a manager in top of self-organization, oh, that's dictatorship. That's Taylorism! Okay. <laughs> there, you, you have to be aware that we agilists, there's, our favorite sport is pointing at things we don't like and saying, that's not agile! Okay. <laughs> You're going to see a lot of that. Okay. So what do we have today for lunch? Oh, Spinax. Uh, Spinax. I don't like Spinax. Spinax are not agile. <laughs> It's Taylorism, okay, so yeah. <laughs> managers are ta so Tayloristic, okay. So no managers, okay, I think this is a mistake. I've also seen people saying, Agile is love. <laughs> kumbaya, kumbaya, our Lord. I swear that when the Agile in Europe network was created, which is a huge network in LinkedIn, it started as a group, the first question they posted on the forum was like, what's Agile for you? And I swear that the first answer we got was Agile is love. <laughs> uh, what? I thought there was some software development involved. Ah, oh, no, no, no. You mean shipping products? That's so Tayloristic. That's so 20th century. <laughs> now we are beyond that. Now we are like, ooh. Now I think that some, some, there's some sort of people understanding that this Agile thing is flower power, and I think it's also a mistake. Then we also have people saying, oh, self-organizing teams, we decide. We decide priorities. This is a true story. I was coaching a team, and then suddenly I see a developer stand up, go to the board, and then get a, um, get a, um, a note, uh, a, a user story, and put it on top of the list. And I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I think this is a high priority. And I'm like, uh, yeah, well, okay, that, I, I respect your opinion, but have you talked to your product owner? What do you mean, product owner? We are a self-organizing team. Ooh, terrorism. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it wasn't supposed to work like that. 
Or for instance, we have, a I, I swear it's a, a true story, <laughs> a team that decided to go back to Waterfall and they say, no, 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 we, we don't like Scrum, we hate this Scrum thing, so we decided as a self-organizing team to reinstallate Waterfall. This is like if you give self-organization to a team and they create like a ministry with bureaucracy and ministries and, and secretaries and, you know, and paperwork. Okay, that's nice, that's interesting. Anything can happen when you give self-organization to teams. Or for instance, uh, there was a team in another country that I was in contact with um, and when they contacted me, they were like really, really uh, concerned that they had started this Scrum thing and since they started, there was no software being uh, d uh, delivered to the customer in six months. And I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, because the team, when they were given self-organization, they decided not to develop any more software. They decided to refactor the core of the application because it was hyper buggy, okay? And I'm like, ah, <laughs> okay, there's several things that we have to enter again, okay. But it was like a huge misunderstanding. And, they, and I was like, what have you said about that? Oh, oh we said nothing. They are self-organizing, they are self-organizing. We are supposed to let them self-organize in order to get hyper productivity, okay. Um, I had another team where um, we said, okay, um, you may not know it, but it's a good thing that you write unit tests, okay? <laughs> and they were like introduced to the idea of unit tests, like in the second decade of the 21st century, that's interesting. Um, and we said, okay, it's up to you. And they said, well, how many tests do we have to write? Because there's a definition of done that says that software needs to be unit tested and this unit test needs to be automated. And I was like, no, no, I mean, how many tests you write is up to you. You decide, you are in years. So the first numbers I crunched around the software development, they have been doing like 6,000 lines of code and they had like three unit tests. And I was like, eh, no, that's not supposed to be right. And they were, oh, we are self-organizing. We decide that this is the right number. We are happy with it. Okay, so now do, what do you do? You go to the books and you are like, Jeff Sutherland, Ken Schwaber, help me. Well, uh, this is not in the Scrum books. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to happen that way. And then we have one of my personal favorites, which is cosmetic Scrum, okay? We have an evil organization doing things really, really wrong, but we put the Scrum on top of it. Well, it's, but you're still Mordor, okay? Yeah, like, like you're still for the ring, which is like pending, <laughs> even though you have already recruited Saruman and you're in the middle of Helm's Deep battle, which is what you see in this, in this scrum board, eh? in a daily meeting with, Sarum, uh, with uh, uh, you know, Sauron and all the orcs. But, you know, it's, it's very useful. I see that over and over and over. It's, that, it's like you wear scrum as you wear uh, makeup, cosmetics. You keep doing, you know, scrum, scrum is probably one of the easiest things to fake in the universe. It's very easy to fake Scrum. You just keep doing things the, the, the same way. But every single time you know there's something that needs to be done, you put it in a column that says pending. And then when you are doing that, sometimes during months, okay, you put that on a column that says ongoing. And then when it's done, you put it on a column that it's like done. And they, hey, yeah, Scrum. <laughs> and then someone says, no, 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 there's, there's supposed to be like, like uh, a process and roles. And oh, yeah, 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 we have plenty of those. Once a month, we have the product owner comes with uh, 300 tasks. He, she puts it into the table and, and says, this needs to be done in a month. So now we have product owner, product backlog, pl planning session, and estimates. How cool is that? <laughs> this needs to be done in a month. <laughs> and then every day, we have a project manager that appears and says, hey, how are you doing? Are you, are you, are you late already? Are you, are you delayed? Are you delayed? Are you on time? Are you on time? And we call that the daily meeting. Then once a month, we deliver some something and then the client yells at us for an hour saying this is not what I asked for, this is not what I told you, you are morons, you don't even, ah. And then after, well, that's the, the demo by the way, and then we go to a bar, we order some gin tonics and we say, man, it sucks working here. And that's a retrospective, so uh, check, 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 check. 100% Scrum certified, how cool is that, okay? <laughs> So if, and then people say, well, it's, uh, things haven't really improved since we start doing Scrum, no wonder. <laughs> I mean, you keep doing the things the same. That's cosmetic Scrum, okay, and that's so painful. Um, no wonder that some, some people say, okay, yeah, Agile only work if you have superstars. If you have superstar developers like you have in SDX and X, by the way, <laughs> then, oh, then Agile works. But with regular people, oh, it's never worked because you need people that are very disciplined, but then people say, yeah, of course, but the fact is, if you have fantastic people like superstars, you can do Agile or you can do whatever. They are superstars, they're gonna be doing great. Uh, no matter if they do Agile or they, do not, uh, they don't do Agile, they, they will find something. 
And yeah, that's a problem because people start stop believing in this idea of the self-organizing teams. When you have been through all this crap I've been through, <laughs> you start questioning this stuff like, oh, does it really exist? Can we see, can we really find this unicorn team? Okay, like it's like self-organizing hyperproductive, okay? Lost unicorn, we cannot find the unicorns. And this is as it designed, that's reads, lost unicorn. If found, stop doing drugs, okay? Uh, yeah, I sometimes fi find like, uh, or feel like self-organizing hyperproductive teams are like unicorns, they are lost and we cannot find them. So, what went wrong? What happened? Uh, you know, Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut, said, they promised me colonies in Mars. And all I got was Facebook. <laughs> okay, so I feel I, I find I feel myself betrayed by the software industry and the science industry. And this is what happens to us with self-organizing hyperproductive teams. Oh, yeah, it's nice. We have boards and Jira and all this kind of stuff. But where is the magic? You know, what went wrong? And I think that you remember this slide when we were so inspired by the stories on these hyper agile companies, hyper productive, hyper motivated companies. We were very, very inspired, but we didn't get that small detail. And the small detail is that these companies are describing the view from the top of the mountain. I mean, this is like top notch. This is like the best companies are performing. And these are companies that have been developing this culture and these processes for like eight years or 10 years. And now they are at a point where they can say, okay, now we are at a point that we have developed enough maturity in our teams that we can decide our own salaries, hire managers, decide hirings and firings together, or maybe like in Netflix where there's no accountability of holiday day, uh, of uh, holiday days. I mean, you can go on a holiday as much as many days as you consider you deserve. Nobody's counting the days you are out of a building. But that's top of the mountain. They have been developing this culture for like a decade or even even more. And they say, oh, I'm in the top of the mountain. And I say, wow, this is an amazing place to go paragliding, for instance. And we say, OK, let's do that. And we are in the base of the mountain. We are starting. So we put our, par our parachutes, and we start running, and we jump, and we bump into the, into the floor. And we are like, oh, what happened? But the Google guy says this is a good place for paragliding. Ooh, they, they lied to us. And that's because they are on top of a mountain and you are in the base of a mountain. And you want everything on a Monday morning, 8 a.m. It doesn't work that way. There's a journey. And this is what I'm talking about in this, in this speech. Um, there's also a problem of underpunk gnomes. How, who, how many of you know the underpunk gnomes? Yay, thank you, Mikey. This is a South Park character. Okay? It's a, in an episode in South Park, the, uh, Jeff Patton is the guy that uses this example, by the way. I have to give credit to him. Um, and in an episode, they have these tiny gnomes that are stealing people's underpants. So they, they catch one of the gnomes and they, and they ask him, why are you stealing the underpants? And the gnome says, oh, for profit. Uh, for profit. Uh, how does it work? And they say, oh, it's very easy. It's step one, we steal underpants. Then we have step two, and on step three, we get profit. And you're like, uh, yes. But what's a step two? And he says, I don't understand the question. Says, yeah, what's a step two? And then I was like, well, step one is stealing underpants. Yeah, but what's step two? Well, step three is getting profits. <laughs> and you are like, there's some information missing in the middle. And I think that we have the same situation when we say, okay, we have a bunch of code monkeys uh, run by a dictator ar architect telling everyone how, what to code and how to code it, okay? This beautiful image from the 90s <laughs> with cubi cubicles. Uh, any, anyone remember cubicles? I've been in cubicles. <laughs> uh, but I'm old. <laughs> Um, and then we have like, you know, these code monkeys, step one, then step two, and step three, hyperproductive self-organizing teams. Okay. <laughs> Underpan gnome situation. What's step two? <laughs> Please tell us about step two. Um, step two is uh, all it takes to, to create team maturity. And team maturity is something very, diff very different from individual maturity. I mean, uh, sometimes you have people that individually are very mature, and they have like mortgages, wives, kids, I mean, uh, good citizens, everything. But when you put them together, what you have is an immature team because the people do not know how to collaborate, do not know how to deal with conflict, do not know how to pursue synergies or how to solve their, their, their conflicts and, and have agreements. So what you have is mature people in an immature team. Um, so what we need is, is a way to develop those teams into the kind of teams we have been told about. Um, 
Bob Gallen, for instance, I have been seeing a lot of tendencies and trends to talk about this. Bob Gallen talk, oh, sorry, Bob Gallen talks about uh, patterns in, in mature agile teams. And he says, when you see mature teams, you see several patterns. And each of these patterns has, can be developed independently. So like, for instance, um, we see that, that these guys are proactive and have a self-organization culture and are very focused on the customer and T-shaped professionals. But for instance, you can see that these guys, for instance, are doing uh, massive amounts of testing. So you can start like, introducing those patterns into the teams, and they will get better over time in this kind of, 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 uh, of behaviors. So, so for instance, there's a skills involved. In, in these mature uh, teams that Bob Gallen has been studying, one of the things he sees is you see people that have been developing their skills a lot. If you have people that do not know the basics of programming, the basics of coding, agility is very difficult because they don't know how to create, like uh, there was a talk this afternoon about iterative incremental development. That's difficult. It's way easier to start layer one, full layer, and then layer two, and then layer three. Like we start with the back end and we start with the front end. And before we start with the thing in the middle of the back end and the front end, someone says, oh, deadline, show me the product. And you're like, no, sorry, it's not ready because we have the back end and we have the front end, but we, have not, we don't have the thing in the middle. So that's not iterative incremental in the sense that you don't have something that is useful as soon as possible. And when you tell these people, oh, let's try to do vertical slicing, that's small, like small features that have all, both back end and middle and, and front end and everything, oh, that's not possible, not here. And I'm like, not here where? Not here in Poland, <laughs> not here in Poznan, not here in this company, not here in this floor of the company. Where, where's the singularity? Because people are doing this everywhere. So where's this singularity here where the universe just falls over itself and creates a strange hole that mangles the fabric of time and space so we cannot do iterative incremental development? Uh, it's, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that you cannot do that. Okay? So one of the things you need is skilled people. So you have to develop the skills of your people. Of course, that leads to maturity. Then you have collaboration, as I mentioned. Even though you might have very, very talented developers, if they don't ha know how to collaborate, that's a problem. I see hundreds of Agile teams where they, they have a board and the dailies, and when they report on the daily meetings, they, they, the first sign of something is going wrong is that they say, oh, we hate daily meetings. Daily meetings are supposed to be awesome. If you hate your daily meetings, something is wrong. It's like, excuse me, I know this is being recorded, but it's like sex, okay? If you say, oh, it's boring, you're doing it wrong! <laughs> Definitely, you're doing it wrong. I don't know what you're doing, but it's not supposed to be boring. I mean, <laughs> so daily meetings is, is something similar. You should be enjoying daily meetings. It's your opportunity to bright and shine and talk to your colleagues and synchronize together and tell stories. That's nice. So if you're doing it wrong, and one of the ways you're doing that wrong is that you have seven, seven people and uh, then someone says, okay, so I'm working in project A, blah, 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 everyone is bored. Then the second person says, okay, so I'm, pre I'm working in project B, and you're like, excuse me? And then the third person says, oh, I'm working on project C, and you're like, no wonder you are bored, you are doing it wrong. Because this is not a team, this is a bunch of people sitting together. You are not collaborating. There's a barrier between coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. We don't have time to go into the details. But if you are not like swarming into problems and discussing together, you're not collaborating. And then no wonder you're not going to get any hyper productivity. This is the kind of things you are, we are looking for. Maturity, team identity. One of the things I like is when I see teams that have a very, very bonded identity. Like they have a team a name and they have the pet and they have stories and jokes that they, only, they are the only one, the ones that understand them. And, and they have like their customized board and that starts to create like an identity of the team and this team starts to jellyfy together. Some teams are like, well, I, don't know. I don't have friends in my company. My company is a job, it just pays the mortgage. Well, it's very difficult that you are gonna get hyper-productive self-organizing teams with this kind of lack of identity, lack of culture. So again, developing an identity is something that will help your teams to self-organize and to be hyper-productive. But self-organization, and this is a key, Self-organization needs a self. And in order to have a self, this self that organizes, this team that is self-organizing needs a, a, a sensation of self. And that's why we talk about identity. But self needs constraints, needs limits. Like I am here, and that's chair, me, chair. Okay, so I know there's a limit, there's a boundary of what I call myself, and some atoms in the universe that I don't feel that they belong to myself. 
Self-organization, in fact, if you go to the science and if you go to people that, that uh, people in fields like uh, complex adaptive systems, they will tell you that self-organization uh, only happens in the presence of constraints. If there's no constraints, what you have is chaos. But self-organization needs constraints. Um, and these boundaries and constraints can be put on place in the form of goals, like, for instance, uh, you know, Self-organization can lead to anything. I will, I will explain that later. You need a, a, a common goal. You need some boundaries. You need some rules. Because what if the team decides to self-organize to play basketball? And we have a football field, and we want to f win the football championship. But oh, they are self-organizing. And, and, and if you say, no, 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 we're playing football, some people feel like, oh, you are uh, managing that team. You're bossing that team around. No, I give them some clear goal, and I give them, and I give them a set of rules, which is the rules of football. But it's up to them how to play the game. It's up to them how to, who's going to be like, like the goalkeeper, if they're going to play attack or defense. That's the game, but it's football. You, they don't get to decide we're going to play hockey on a, on, a, on a Monday afternoon. It's football, and it's on a Sunday evening, for instance. Um, so these kind of boundaries can be deadlines, can be budget, can be how many people you have, and can be the kind of products we do in this company. And that's absolutely aligned with the idea of self-organization. Let me give you an example. This is constrained self-organization. Barcelona in Spain is a worldwide known example of architecture and urbanism, okay? The city is self-organizing. Each person, each building has been built by a different person, different architect, and, and, and shops open and close and get transferred, and people buy flats and sell flats, and you construct new buildings. But you can see that some rules have been put on place here. You can absolutely sense it. There's a sense of order that comes through a self-organization that has been constrained. Whereas if you go to Rio de Janeiro, you can see that those constraints may not have been very clear. I mean, yeah, this is a self-organization. But both things are self-organization, which means that self-organization is not good by itself. Self-organization can lead to things like the mafia. The mafia is a self-organizing team. There's, there's no process book. It's not like, uh, okay, I'm going to, I want to buy this cup. Oh, then you have to fill this form, and you have to be approved by your, mob, by your mob boss or something. There's no process in the mafia. It's a self-organizing. But it's not necessarily a good thing. You don't want the mafia to happen in your company. So you better put some rules like, hey, you know what? It's nice when you build your house on top of your neighbor's house. Okay, that's usually a good rule. Okay. Regularism. No, it's, it's, it's good neighborhood. <laughs> so I think that maturity at the end, it's, it's, it's about a journey. It's about steps that lead to this kind of, to acquiring these, these skills, steps that lead to uh, the need of less boundaries and less constraints as the team is getting more the sense and the feel of what's the goal and the vision of the purpose of the company. Um, for instance, this idea of journey, I've seen it in several places. Um, by the way, what's my time frame? Because I, I forgot to look at the 15 minutes. Cool, thank you. So for instance, I saw this presentation by, uh, you can see it online on Martin Fowler's uh, website by James Shore and Diana Larson. They talk about the agile fluency model. And the agile fluency model says there's an aspirational style uh, uh, state here that we call optimize for the system. Like the full system is agile, but usually you don't start there. You start as a, as a coder, okay? So you need basic coding skills. And then you form teams, and these teams at the beginning, they are not very agile. So the first thing that they, they advise is you focus on value. So give them a business perspective. Instead of just coding, 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 try to talk about the problem we are solving, try to talk about who's our customer, try to empathize with the kind of things we are doing. And then after that, we can, uh, we can start focusing on delivering value. And then we start measuring velocity and measuring cadence and having Kanban boards and making the system flow and removing elements. So there's a process for that. There's some, some steps. You don't, you don't jump from coder to optimizing for the systems. That's like gnomes. You are missing all the steps in the middle. Then, for instance, Tuckman. Tuckman, in 1965, uh, he enunciated a model for team growth that is still on use. We still believe that the, he hit a chord here. He says, you put a bunch of people together, and at the beginning, they, you, that's the forming stage, and at the beginning, they are just, oh, yeah, sitting together, that's it. Then you give them some common goal. You coordinate get them. You have to be doing this and this and this. 
And they start to argue because I, they say, oh, I want to do these things this way. And then another person will say, no, 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 let's do it that way. Right? According to my experience, the first thing that coders want to decide on a product is let's do it in Java, let's do it in Python. No, Python, not Java. We're not talking about the customer or the why or the product or the value or the business model. Uh, let's do it in Python. No, in Java. Let's use this tool. No, why don't you use Trello, <laughs> for instance? No? So uh, we cannot agree. So suddenly Mikey says, okay, you know what? I'm going to form my team there uh, with, with Blackjack <laughs> and Horse, <laughs> like Bender in, in that episode. I'm going to form my teams in that, in that corner. I'm going to use my things. And I'm not going to say, okay, then I'm going to team there and I'm gonna do things my way that means that we have some arguments we didn't find consensus and then we revert to the forming stage we keep doing things in our own I prefer do things by my own I'm more comfortable it's better for me <laughs> and we see a lot of that oh I, I work better that way even though I'm making the company bankrupt but it's comfortable for me Okay, it's not going to be comfortable for you when we go bankrupt, okay? We have to optimize for the whole system, and that means that we have to work together, and that means that sometimes you are uncomfortable because you would like things to be some way, and people would like to prefer to do things in another way. So we need to find a way to collaborate. We need to find a way to create ways of working. All my teens, when we work for some time, besides their board, they will have a poster with our way, our, our way of working statement, or it might be called the ground rules, or it might be called some other way. But it's like small set of rules. This is how we take decisions. This is how we uh, celebrate meetings. This is how we meet consensus. This is how we disagree. This is how we give, we give feedback, for instance. Um, and if we excel at creating these norms and showing people ways they can collaborate together and solve these conflicts, then people evolve to this performing state where they start to collaborate together. This was Stuckman in 1965, and we still have to repeat it because people haven't got it. So another thing I found in this reinforcement of the idea of the, of the journey, tribal leadership. Tribal leadership is an amazing book. I love it. And tribal leadership describes five stages of corporate culture. And they say different individuals can be in different stages of this, of the, of this uh, uh, range. Level one is life sucks. Okay, usually people in life sucks state um, give, themselves, give themselves to alcoholism or maybe they appear one day at the office with a, with a shotgun or something. Okay, so that's difficult. Okay, that's pe people in the verge of a nervous breakdown or something. So that's not very useful, but what is very useful is to find people in level two. My life sucks. Okay, that's an advance. <laughs> that's, that's a progress because now you acknowledge that some other people's lives, basically your boss, <laughs> That's not suck, okay? He's the one, you know, driving a BMW and playing golf and all that stuff. But my life, as a coder, my life sucks, okay? This is people on level two. They feel like powerless. They feel like demotivated. They are like, oh, yeah. You try to, oh, let's do agile. Let's, ah, no, that will never work here. That's a sign of people on level two. And if you do things right and you develop people on level two, then you will get some people that eventually will evolve to level three. Level three is... I am the best, and underline it, and you are not. <laughs> uh, so usually what happened in the 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century is that we have huge companies that are, are being run by level three individuals that become bosses because they are great, they are the best, and level two individuals, powerful, min uh, powerless minions that are told what to do, okay, and oh, yeah, okay, my life sucks. So we need to move this model of level three individuals yelling at shouting at level two individuals. We need to go to a level four stage where first we develop everyone so everyone find their own competence and they find that they are good at their craft. So you have several level three individuals and now you put them together until they say, we are the best, they are not. And that's, that's a, a, a very, very amazing epiphany. When you see that happening, when you are in a company where we say, we are the best, like for instance, the Linux guys, they will say, Linux, we are the best, and Microsoft is not. And then the Apple guys that will go, hey, we are the best, and Microsoft is not. And, and you know, basically everyone in the industry is going like, we are the best, and Microsoft is not. <laughs> Microsoft is like the bad, any, any Microsoft employees in the building? No, okay. <laughs> It's always fun making fun, you know, it's always, it always works making fun of a big guy. <laughs> so yeah, but you know, having a common enemy is sometimes a, a symptom of, of level four culture. It's us against them. 
especially when it's someone outside the building. If you create a level four culture, you say, we at development are the best, not like the marketing guys. The marketing guys suck. That's a, that's a bad thing for your company, okay? So that's one of the reasons we create cross-functional teams. And we put marketing guys to work with development teams. So we say we are the best as a company, and we are going to beat the heck out of the market. That's level four. And level four creates structure, creates teams that are interdependent. So when you remove one person, they don't collapse. In a, in a level three plus level through company, when you remove the level three individual, the level two people collapse because now they have no, no leadership, they have no direction, they have no goals. So they collapse. The structure is not resilient, it's not robust, it's fragile. So we need level four cultures. And there are ways that you can create these level four cultures. But there's a journey. You cannot start on level four. You arrive at level four. Um, Management 3.0, and I'm trying to go faster here. When I joined Management 3.0, one of the things that struck me was the idea of progressive delegation. They say, it's not like I'm taking all the decisions, but then on a Monday morning, hey, you know what, holacracy, we take the decisions together or something like that. You arrive that after a process. I bet that, 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 that Robin didn't create the company as a holacracy model, or maybe he, he did, but probably it was a progress, and then you arrive at a point where it made more sense that keep things the old way. So there's a process to that. So basically, maybe you start by telling people what to do, no explanations. Uh, yeah, we are moving from Poznan to Thailand. Uh, no explanations given. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm the boss. You stop. Oh, my life sucks. So now you have like level three plus level two. And you have then level, uh, you have a second level of delegation, which is like, I will take the decisions, but I will tell you about the reasons of that decision. Okay, we are going to open a, the market in China because of this and this and this and that and that and that. And we consider this and these options, but they are bad because of this and this. And basically what you are doing is teaching your people to take decisions. Okay? Then you have level three, which is consult. I will take the decision, but before I take the decision, and let's be clear, it's my decision, I want to hear your, your opinions. Oh, that's nice. You have to be careful because if they are always giving you, uh, you their opinion and you are always saying like, nah, I will do something else, they will say, what do you ask? But if every once in a while they'll give you some important feedback, you will, might be like, okay, let's try that. Or I'll take my decision, but I'll incorporate some ideas of the things you told me. Then you can start evaluating how good are these people at taking these decisions. And then we might move to agree. Let's take decisions together. Like in hiring, I, I advise my customers for agreed hiring. Like, as a start. Like saying, I'm the manager, I will select several people, and then you, team, get a vote on which of these people you like, which of those people you hate. So you're going to have lunch with these people, you're going to work with these people one day, they're going to be like, I don't know, playing some testing with you guys, and looking at some code, and at the end of the day, you have to tell me, yeah, we like the guy, or nah, he doesn't like fit with us. Because if you hire someone and you put him into a team, and, they, and he doesn't fit into the team, that's going to cost like a lot of money. And the problem is that you never see it because it doesn't show up in the, in the reports, in the, in, the, in the accountancy forms and all these kind of things. So let's do this. I will select five people that I like as a manager and you, keep to you, you get to choose which one do you like the best. So now we are agreeing on a, on a hiring. That's a good way of start like collaborating. So they start getting more power of decision and then they grow in maturity. And then you have advice. I will give you some advice. You take the decision. Inquire, which is like, I will ask, you will take the decision, but please tell me the decision, I need to know it. And you have full delegation. Take the decision, don't you, ever, don't you even tell me about it. And different things can be delegated at different levels. Like for instance, the decision of moving the company to, uh, to, uh, to Thailand might be some, I don't know, a strategical stuff that is not delegated to the people, but should be at, at least sold to the people, explained to the people. Hiring can be something that we agree, Estimates, I, I, I may inquire. I need to know your estimates. You are the one deciding on the estimates, but please tell me because I need to calculate the deadlines. But when it's about, oh, branches management in, in, the, in the, I don't know, in the versioning system or using this and this tool, I'm like, I don't want to know. That's your decision. Don't you even tell, tell me. You are, why are you wasting my neurons with that? I, that's useless information for me. <laughs> I'm trying to get it out of my head. <laughs> So there's a progress. You start by telling, and over time, you give like, people like, like more um, participation on the process. And here is this story I like to tell about, about my kid. Okay, my kid, now he's 10. But when he was three or four, I was, I was bringing him to the bus station, which is like up my street, then we go around a, a block, then we have to cross another street, and there's a bus station for the school. Um, there's also a candy shop there. 
So at the beginning, I was holding his hand, and I was walking with him, split, uh, talking to him, but I was like grabbing him because I didn't trust him that he would go and cross the street or something. Over time, I saw that he was like, not like pulling or trying to break. So I started like, you know, setting him free, but telling him to always be walking behind me. And then I told him to walk beside me. And then over time, I told him, now you walk in front of me, and I will be walking one step behind you. So I could just even grab him if, 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 if he forgot to look on the street for traffic or something. And then when he, in his fifth birthday, I said, OK, Angel, now you're a big guy. You're a mature person, much more mature than many software developers that I meet in my, in my <laughs> professional career. <laughs> Uh, so here you are, one euro, okay, that's basically like four slotties. Uh, now you will go alone uh, to the candy shop, which is in the bus station. You know the way, I know you know the way. You will go alone, buy some candy, come back. Really, Daddy, can I go? Yeah, yeah, you're going alone. So I, there I was at the door of my home, seeing my small kid walking by, crossing the first street, crossing the second street, going across the, the, the block, and then you don't see him. And then you experiment the five most terrifying minutes of your life, okay? <laughs> Where you start to think about any possibility, including intelligent velociraptors that break their cages <laughs> and prey on small children in the streets and all that. And you're like, oh my God, it should be back. I mean, it's, it's been a full minute. I mean, <laughs> but then after some, uh, you know, anxious five minutes, he, you see he's coming back with a kinder chocolate in his hand. <laughs> And, and he's so proud. He seems like he just killed a bear with his bare hands. Like, Daddy, look what I got. <laughs> and that's powerful. And that's the kind of things I like to do with teams in order to develop their maturity to be self-organizing. There's a process. You don't start by saying you take all the decisions. Final, final two or three minutes, my own model of a journey. This was a, this was a huge success in Warsaw last year. Um, I started feeling this idea of the journey when I started uh, talking about the Scrum Master maturity model, okay? I said, I've seen Scrum Masters and people do not agree on what's the role of the Scrum Master. Should the Scrum Master tell people what to do? No, the Scrum Master is like a fly on the wall. He doesn't say anything. He just, he just uh, you know, um, he just mm, suggests by his presence that things could be done in a different way. You know? What are you talking about? Jedi mind tricks or something? What's this? And there was a lot of discussion and then I realized that people were arguing from different points of the mountain. Some people on top of the mountain were describing Scrum Mastership. Some people on the base of the mountain were describing Scrum Mastership. No wonder they didn't agree. So for instance, in the, in the, in the, in the base of the mountain, you don't have Scrum Masters. You have the Scrum Dude. Okay, you remember Big Lebowski? <laughs> Thank you, Mikey, for the support. <laughs> you have the Scrum Dude, like, coming every day, like, oh, oh so, so, let's do a daily Scrum, no? Uh, uh, so, Mikey, wh what are you doing, doing yesterday? Oh, cool. <laughs> what are you doing today? Awesome. Uh. Is there any impediments? No, uh, rad. Okay. And that's it, basically, okay? And then once every two weeks, he says, okay, let's do retrospective. Uh, what did we do? Great. Okay, this and this. What we don't like? Uh, this and this and this and this. Okay, the retrospective over. So no wonder that these people say, oh, ro we rotate the Scrum Master role. And I'm like, you do what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we rotate the Scrum Master role. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. Do you do that with the product owner? Do you rotate the product owner role? Uh, no. Do you rotate the chief executive officer role? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I understand. Those are like real roles, not like the Scrum Master, which is like a uh, Scrum Dude. So yeah, Scrum Dude, it happened. And then if you are somehow lucky, somewhere on the time, eventually one Scrum Dude will evolve, like in Pokemon. <laughs> and he will become the Scrum Mom, okay? Uh, <laughs> Everybody likes the Scrum Mom. Scrum Mom is awesome, okay? Because the team starts like, Mommy, Mommy, the bad manager came with a user story in the middle of a sprint. And Scrum Mom goes like, who, who, that manager? That manager told you what? What do you tell my kids? And the managers are like, whoa, whoa, come down, maybe. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves the Scrum Mom. And, and it's great, the team are like, oh, it's cool having a Scrum Mom. A scrum Mom protects the team. And then Scrum Mom will, will, will provide for the team. I'm like, I like, oh, mommy, I cannot raise this. I, I, cannot, I cannot find this continuous integration system. And she's like, ta -ta -ta -ta, don't hurt yourself. I will create that continuous integration system for you guys. You just keep coding. I will do it for you. And everyone's like, it's good to have a Scrum Mom. Okay? It's like, I cannot get a jar of cookies, so she will get it for me. That's amazing. Okay, perfect. And then, um, but this 
couple of bad, uh, there's also a good thing that they don't like that much, but it's a good thing, and it's that teams eventually will say, oh, we don't want to eat our vegetables, and we don't like to do automate the testing. And then Scrum Mom will say, you will eat your vegetables, you will automate tests, or you will have them for the breakfast. And you're like, okay, okay, <laughs> we'll automate the test. But on the long run, they say, ah, yeah, it's a good thing we have a Scrum Mom, because if not, we, were, we weren't, we won't be like eating our vegetables, doing our homework, automating tests. So Scrum Mom is keeping us up in the, in the good pace. But there's a bad side to Scrum Mom. And the bad side to Scrum Mom is that uh, Scrum Mom now is really, really comfortable. She's like providing value for the team, finally. Now she sees that, oh, I'm providing value, I'm a Scrum Master. And then the team is so comfortable, she's doing a lot of stuff for them. So it might get like a uh, uh, perpetual state. And then you get like, you have like, like we have in Spain now, 40 somethings on the couch. Mom, what do you have for dinner? <laughs> That's not something good. You have to kick these people out of a building somewhere and say, go get a life. Uh, mature. Uh, I don't need, I don't know. Have kids, have fun or something. So another bad thing or downside of the, of the Scrum Mom is that the Scrum Mom doesn't deal with conflict. When you have two people in the team, it's my turn to play with the continuous integration system. No, you played with the continuous integration system yesterday, that's my turn. Then Scrum Mom shows and says, da, 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 what's happening here? Go to your places, keep coding. And one, go to their places. But she hasn't solved the conflict. She hasn't ta uh, taught them how to navigate that conflict. She just got rid of the conflict. And that's a bad thing because she's not letting the team solve these things by their own. She's not telling them how to, how to solve these kind of things. By the way, I, got a, <laughs> I once got an angry email by a Scandinavian lady saying that I was perpetuating gender stereotypes with a scrum mom. <laughs> and my answer went in the line of, I don't fucking care. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is videotape, okay? <laughs> this is stand-up comedy, come on, I'm trying to make people laugh. Everyone loves a scrum mom. She said, what do you... What do you <laughs> She suggested, why didn't you talk about Scrum Dad? And I was like, no, it's definitely Scrum Mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we need, oh, by the way, I will be soon issuing certified Scrum Mom certificates. Not, of course. <laughs> I'm against the certificate culture. So Scrum Mom needs to evolve to, to true Scrum Mastership, which is not about doing things for the team all the time. It's about showing the team how to do these things. It's not about getting rid of conflict. It's about showing the team how to navigate conflict. It's not about protecting the team. It's about showing the team how to protect themselves, how to think, how to... So it's, it's a state where you can help the teams mature. But the thing I learned, oh, let's say that it's, there's this aspirational state, which is the agile nirvana, where we have agile senses that just stay there, and with their presence, they are influencing people into the good way of, the, of doing things. I've seen some really, really strange shit out there. I mean, <laughs> I've seen people doing stuff like, how do you do that? <laughs> well, it's agile superpowers. I'm not there yet. <laughs> so. But the thing is that I learned that you cannot go into Agile Sensei mode with a Scrum Dude team. It doesn't work. Because you try coaching, for instance, and the team is like, you arrive at the team with your, you know, llama robes, and say, good, good morning team, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. How are you today? Bad. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. What, why is that? We hate Agile. Why do you hate Agile? It sucks. <laughs> well, do you think that's a fact, or is it more, something more emotional? It's a fact. <laughs> Uh, well, but what are the options? Yeah, we want to go back to Waterfall, but will going back to our Waterfall solve your problems? Absolutely. And you're like, damn, this coaching thing is not working. <laughs> so basically, say, you know what? You're going to do Agile because I tell you so, and that's a Scrum Mom. Because the Scrum Dude teams needs a Scrum Mom. I mean, you cannot have a three-year-old and say, okay, you decide here, you are a Visa card, here you are the keys of the apartment. <laughs> now you decide, work yourself out, your way out to college. <laughs> it doesn't work that way uh, with human beings, with individuals. It doesn't work that way with teams either. Okay, that's my belief. So several models together. That's the end of my talk. You have uh, tribal leadership. You have Agile fluency, you have management 3.0 and the, the, uh, the progressive delegation. You have my own model of Scrum Master maturity. There are steps. You have to focus on the path, not on the, uh, of course you have the destination on mine, and the destination is far, but you have to uh, focus on the next small step. And it's this continuously doing small steps, which is Kaizen, continuous improvement, that will bring this kind of self-organizing teams and um, hyperproductive teams. So as, um, as an ending to my talk, I will say that I can understand and I can relate that some many of you do not believe in unicorns anymore. You are like, nah, this is not going to happen, not here. I've been trying for several years and I haven't seen e even one self-organizing, hyper-productive teams. 
But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because even if you don't believe in unicorns, unicorns do believe in you. <laughs> Thank you.